Hi, good day, good evening, good night, good morning, wherever you are, while you're watching, while you're listening. I'm Ricardo Mitchell, communication strategist with the Understanding Israel Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to A Better Understanding, a series of conversations that we plan on having with some of the people that we would have heard about, and a lot of the people that we never heard about, who shared experiences that we've had and had experiences that we haven't. I firmly believe that with a better understanding of each other, we stand a better chance of fostering relationships going forward and that we could build up foundation of communication, progress, development, most importantly, peace. A large focus of this is going to be the relationship between Trinidad and Tobago and Israel and its peoples and its cultures. So we hope to have respectful dialogue. And most importantly, we thank you for joining Understanding Israel Foundation with a better understanding. We'd like to start off with a better understanding about Ambassador Itai Badov, a man who I've met previously, having interviewed him on another platform. And I'm hoping that by the end of this and every conversation we have with a better understanding, someone that I would be able to call a friend. His Excellency Ambassador Itai Badov joined the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs in April 2006 and served previously as head of the political department at the Israeli Embassy in Amman, Jordan, then as deputy head of mission at the Embassy of Israel in Croatia. Between 2014 and 2016, he served as Counselor for Political Affairs at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, USA. Prior to accepting his current position as Israeli Ambassador to Panama, Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, Guyana and Suriname, he was the spokesperson for the Embassy of Israel in Washington, D.C. So, the objective of today's conversation is connecting Trinidad and Tobagonians with the humanity of Israel via the man behind the title, His Excellency, Ambassador Itai Badov. Hello, good morning, good evening, good night. I'm not sure where you are when you're listening or watching as the case may be, but Understanding Israel Foundation presents the first of many beautiful conversations going forward, where it's about a better understanding. And today we're hoping for a better understanding of the Ambassador Itai Badov. He has been an, an amazing friend to the foundation. He's been an amazing friend to the Caribbean and to the community, quite well versed in his arena of diplomacy, and communication. So I'm hoping that this is a, an opportunity for people like me to get a master class in communication and conversation. Uh, Ambassador Itai Badov, how are you doing? Thank you, Ricardo. I'm doing great. And good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone, to you and to your listeners. And I, I have to say, you're quite a ma master class of international relations yourself. I'm, I'm, I've, I've already learned to know you, and uh, I know you, you, you know your stuff quite pretty well as well so but thank you for having me it's a pleasure as always to be here with you well i guarantee you that i'm going to be using that on my social media platform <laughs> that, that is as good as an endorsement as i could have hoped for so, do you, i know we have um a little time with you today and we have a number of questions but i'll be frank i'd like to take the liberty of transparency yes you have had more conversations than i have forgotten you have done more interviews than I could imagine. And I I suspect that at some point in time or another, you would fall into a bit of a, I don't want to call it a routine, because a sense that you also value each exchange on its own merit. I do want to know, though, do you put on your shoes left foot first or right foot first? <laughs> well, um, you know, that's a, I don't even remember how when I get up in the morning, you know, um, what, what the first thing I do is I, I guess I guess I put my shoes on the same feet at the same time. Exactly. Is that possible? But um, but I, I would say I, I, it's a valid point what you're saying, because um, I, I, I am, you know, I'm giving I'm, I'm it, it's not just giving a lot of interviews to the media. It's also speaking um, in different um, different events, speaking to leaders and trying always in, in especially since october 7th trying to uh, uh, present a, um, a a perspective that is not does not really get to be heard that much um, in the caribbean region um, and it's it, many times i find myself even trying to go back to the basics trying to explain history trying to explain the connection between the jewish people to that land and how it's you know it's been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so that 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 is something that every time I, I, I you know, it's it's very different. 
each interview because it depends on who I'm speaking to, what, what I'm speaking about exactly, and the amount of knowledge that that person has. And you are, I know you're, you're very knowledgeable, but um, I am um, definitely, uh, it, it is something that you have to always, you know, from the beginning, try, or it depends at the beginning, where I begin from, it changes according to who I'm speaking to. Yeah, and I, I can appreciate that. I I mean, I've gotten nervous doing interviews and there was a point where I realized that everyone that I speak to is still just a person. And sometimes we confuse the mantle and the agenda of the individual yeah. with the individual themselves. I might like someone and have trouble accepting where they stand or I might understand the position that they have, but I'm not a fan of the person. How do you, as, a, as an ambassador, how do you, as a diplomat, separate the feelings you might have about an individual and the positions that they represent? Oh, well, just like when I'm speaking and the person in front of me doesn't really care about my personal opinion, but rather what, you know, what the stance is of the country that I'm representing, the government that I'm re representing, it, it, no matter who I speak to, I do understand that I'm not. It's not a one-on-one -on -one coffee, um, you know, talk with a friend. It's I'm speaking to someone rep representing a certain organization, a media outlet, and so forth. So, of course, I I will I will differentiate any kind of personal attitude I have to anyone uh, to the the mission at hand. And I and I, I'll be very frank. I I try not to have any kind of personal attitude to someone who dislikes someone uh, based on his uh, opinions and 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 I know that most people are not do not come from you know somewhere that is bad or anti but but sometimes their 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 personal opinions are affected by the surrounding that they are in so I try to understand that but of course as an ambassador I will definitely separate my personal feelings if I have any to um, who I'm speaking to right now on a on a professional basis. Yes, that is brilliant. And I could only assume it presents challenges because when you're in that mode, there will be conversations you might have on a personal level that require you to have a personal investment, but you would have been so practiced in taking diplomatic stances or at least unbiased positions that sometimes the people you're communicating with just want you to be on their side. But, you know, the learned behavior is to analyze and to assess and to try to help. So yeah. what happens on your personal level when someone just wants you to be Itai as opposed to being, you know, ambassador battle? Yeah, I've, you know, it, it's interesting because I, I gave um, I gave a briefing to a group of, of ambassadors here in Panama. And then one of them who's a friend of mine and he said, you know, Tell us what is your personal opinion, and and then it came to a political question regarding the the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I told him, you know, afterwards, you and I, when we're alone, um, I, I, I may share that with you, but I don't think it has any relevance right now to the to this larger forum um, because it. Um, it, it really is not relevant. I'm one out of nine, more than nine million people. And, you know, if you put two Jews or two Israelis in one room, you'll get five different opinions. So my personal opinion is not that relevant. So I try not to be distracted or detracted from that. And I try to always emphasize the government's stance because that is what is important. Whatever I think as Itai Bordov it is, it could be interesting for the person I'm speaking to to hear but it is not relevant, and it, and it could be even. And if I and if I I give my personal opinion in a broad group to a broad group, it might even create the wrong impression of where Israel stands. So I have to be very careful and and diplomatic, as you mentioned, and try and avoid those kind of of issues of speak of, of voicing my personal political opinions, and understand that I'm wearing a specific hat, which is representing the the government of Israel and the state of Israel. And speaking of the government and the state of Israel, I want to speak about Israel for a moment. Uh, just over a year ago, my only Jewish friend at the time asked me to take a walk with him, to have a conversation with him, because he was on a mission. I, I want to acknowledge Nicholas' great work um, in establishing the Understanding Israel Foundation. 
But at the time, I had no idea what assistance I could provide to my friend about something I knew nothing about. And I told him very deliberately, I can only assist you as far as I understand, because I'm not going to parrot sentiments that I don't agree with. I'm not going to lean into and represent a, a, a people and a system that I am not familiar with. And that led to just over a year later, me being able to sit with a, a representation, a, a representative, sorry, of an amazing people and an amazing culture with many challenges and a history of challenges. And the challenge with that in itself is that Nicholas did not grow up in Israel. He's visited Israel. He studied in Israel. He's lived in Israel, but he didn't grow up in Israel. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know from you, what, what mm -hmm. are, can you tell us a little bit about your upbringing in Israel so that we yeah. both have a richer understanding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But first of all, I really appreciate you saying that, you know, because the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is really a very complicated, maybe one of the most complicate, complicated conflicts uh, in, uh, uh, today in the world. But it's one of those uh, um, um, things that people are most opinionated about. They do not have, they might not have all the information. They probably do not have all the information. They did not have the upbringing. They've never even visited the area, but they have a very strong opinion. And you saying that you want to learn more about, you want to understand more before you even give any kind of opinion. To me, I think that's commendable. That That's wonderful. Unfortunately, I think most people don't act that way and they'll create a, a very um, strong opinion or stance toward a, a something that they don't really have a lot of uh, information about. Now, I was born actually in the middle of the desert. I grew up in a in a little village in a little city called Yerucham, which really is um, is a, a, a tiny. Um, we I think there were like when I grew up there were like five or six thousand people living there, and in the middle of the desert. This was part of the vision that the first prime minister of Israel, David, David Ben-Gurion, what he envisioned was that we have to prosper the desert. Um, and so my father, who was a Zionist and believed, you know, a very liberal person who believed in equality for everyone, but also in, in a Jewish state, said, okay, we'll go to live in Yerucham, in the middle of the desert, help, help it to prosper. And at a very later age, where I moved more to the north of Israel, more to the center of Israel, and I lived in Tel Aviv and in Rishon Lezion. I lived in different parts of Israel, um, but I I went through what most Israelis went through: did high school, then went into the army, then university, um, and then worked in different areas and, be, and became a diplomat. So that that that's kind of very. Um, very similar to what most Israelis um, do, how they grow up is, you know, school, military, university. Some of them go and travel, see the world a bit, um, and then and then create a family and 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 you know a professional career. There are two points that I want to acknowledge in that. One of the challenges that we have with understanding Israel as a nation is that many of us don't go through military training, don't go through joining the military as part of our natural social progression. So it highlights for me the, uh, the challenge we have in accepting your norms. And when I say your norms, I'm going to risk, I'm going to risk uh, some discomfort here. Mm -hmm. Having been privy to some of the information that Israel would not want to release to the public out of respect for the victims, there was one sentiment that stood out that, that touched me very deeply. And I apologize for coming across a little passionately or emotively right now, but the idea of having to find bulletproof vests in children's sizes is something that many of us would have no idea about. That when you're building your home, your first home, and you're looking to decorate your nursery, you're thinking of what colors should we go with versus where would be a good place to put a safe room, or would there be enough room for a bomb shelter? The majority of us globally don't have those things to think about. So it, for me, it helped me understand why it is the Israeli experience was so difficult for us to digest. Because, of course, you're not going to dedicate time and resources to posting on social media or to educating people as to the, the social nuances of the challenges when you're faced with a very real day-to-day -day of 
should we have coffee at this spot? There was a bombing last week. My kids have to go to school. Um, do we know where their vests might be? I, I'm not trying to paint up overly dramatic picture. What I'm, but what I'm saying is that it helped me understand the challenges that Israel as a people has had with communicating to other people that we didn't have time to run a, a digestible PR campaign because our survival has become such a deeply rooted part of our lives that we send our kids into the military as part of their growth. Mm -hmm. Is is something like that a reflection of why it is so hard for yeah. outsiders? I think you hit I think you hit the nail on the head. And when we try to explain the sense of security that Israelis, I don't think many people around the world would parrot it and say, oh yeah, Israelis uh, deserve security, but they don't really understand how deeply rooted it is because we're surrounded by millions of people, millions and millions who want to see us exterminated, dead, thrown into the sea. And, and, and we're, we're, we, we have this, you know, this need to defend ourselves on every minute and every hour. And, you know, you mentioned the, the, the bulletproof vest. When I was a child, we had at home, we had uh, masks for chemical um, weapons. Um, a, a, you know, we, we, there were sirens going on because Iraq, under Saddam Hussein at the time, were firing missiles into Israel, which we were concerned because they were, thre we were threatened both by Iraq and Syria that they're going to fire uh, chemical weapons into Israel. So not only did we have to sit, sit in our safe room, we sat with chemical, with these masks, again, chemical weapons. Um, religious Jews would have to shave their beards because they couldn't. So a, a, we're always going through as families, we're going through this uh, a, a really a, a sense of insecurity. Um, you know, these families that were attacked on October 7th, we, we, their children needed a lot of psycho psychological treatment even before the attack because they were so close to Gaza and they were suffering from uh, mortars that were being fired at them and they had, the sirens went on and they had like five seconds to, to hide, to go under a table. Um, and that's on a daily basis. So this, the, 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 and, and, I, and, I'm, and to talk about the, the suicide attacks and the terrorist attacks that since day one, I mean, Israel has been suffering from these kind of attacks and from the need to, to protect itself. And you cannot, you cannot have your children um, uh, avoid this. They're aware of this. They see it, it's around them. It, it becomes part of our life. And um, and then that's why I think in that regard that is why it it is it is like normal for us that part of our up, upbringing and our life is going into the army because we understand that if we do not serve in the army that we will not have a state of Israel and that is it's part of the psyche and you're absolutely right it's sometimes really really difficult to explain for to have others understand um, this the, on the one hand this deep wanting for peace with our neighbors, but on the other hand, the uh, need for ensuring our security and our family security and our sense of security, which is very, very difficult to achieve, unfortunately. I, I a year ago, would not have felt the way that I did on October 7th if I had not been exposed to my Jewish friend and by extension, the Jewish community. As mm -hmm. a Christian, I grew up with this sense of, well, I belong to Israel. I've been grafted into Israel. I've been grafted into God's people. And I thought, well, God's chosen people at the time, it meant, well, you know, he loves them more than others. And it's not that, it's that he, I, I believe he's chosen Israel to represent him in a particular way. And the morning of October 7th, I remember getting up and scrolling through my socials and I saw that a music festival was attacked. And mm -hmm. as the day progressed, instead of getting updates about the attack, the updates were that this thing was still ongoing and that it was not just an isolated attack, that it was the beginning of a, a massacre. Mm -hmm. Do you, and I, I knew how that made me feel at that time, because now I had, even if it was one single connection, how do you remember what you were doing and how the morning of October 7th or afternoon, as the case may be, unfolded for you? 
I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing. And actually, I was just finishing my vacation. I was in the United States, to tell you the truth. And when this happened, I, I was in shock. I was in trauma. And as you mentioned, it, at first, you know, you didn't really understand what's going on because I was glued to the media, to the uh, TV. And first you, you think, okay, there's been a breach. The first uh, rockets fired and then... A, 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 a number of terrorists uh, have breached into Israel. So I was, I was, my, my concern was that they're going to take over a family's house in a kibbutz and try and use that as leverage to release terrorists from from Israeli prisoners who've been who've been apprehended for terrorism. And gradually, I remember how how you 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 get the understanding. Wait, something bigger is happening here, and and even it, it, they were they were having live interviews. With families in their uh, safe rooms, with parents saying we're here with our kids and we're being attacked and we're afraid and we're scared and you know it 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 it, it took some time to really sink in to really understand but then but then it just hit me like some there's something big going on and then of course what I tried and what I worked on was to get back to Panama as quickly as possible. I had a Zoom meeting with my staff already telling them to gather the information to understand what's happened and to start to, and you know we start to send out press releases but this was all we're still getting into it understanding and the 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 trauma the sense of trauma was with us for a long time i'll even say my wife there was no no morning afternoon or evening where she told me how did this happen how did this happen and and it, it was something that you know we, we were will i mean thank god we have such a strong military defense force that managed to turn the tables. And now, you know, they're having amazing successes in Gaza against Hamas, against the terrorists. But though th that, that day of October 7th and the sense of shock that, that uh, followed it, 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 I still sense it till this day because we never expected something like this. And I think that's part of why we, we were not successful in responding uh, uh, quickly enough is because we didn't we had the misconception we did not expect such a kind of a, of attack to happen not because we didn't know that Hamas is a brutal barbaric terrorist organization is because we thought that Hamas would not do something that would literally endanger their governance but I, I think we we slowly slowly understanding more and more of what happened and why Hamas did what it did and it did it first of all because they saw Israel and Saudi Arabia warming up relations and of course every time peace becomes a factor then you have the extremists uh, and the terroristic organizations such as Hamas and Jihad, Islamic Jihad who are against it but secondly is I think they believe that this would create a ripple um, and create a a, a, a regional war against Israel. Um, and I think in that regard, they were surprised to see that that did not happen. Of course, it created a, an enormous tension in the region, but uh, the fact that Israel retaliated the way it did and, and, that, um, and that the Israeli military is, has been so successful has also, in my opinion, acted as a, as a deterrence to others, not to, um, not to attempt, attempt the same thing that Hamas did. Now, we could recognize that this is has been a season that has changed Israel's not just its history but its future. It has changed the way that Israel as a nation looks at its neighbors, at the global community, even at itself. But the question I would have for you is how has this changed you as a man, as a father, as a husband? That's a very good question. Um, of course, being a father, I think that that's the biggest effect. Uh, concerned about my, you know, my, I have two boys who are 16. Um, so they're, as I, as I explained, you know, the process in Israel. So they're part of the process. They will go into the military. And on the one hand, I understand deeply that this, this has to be done uh, in order for Israel to survive. But on the other hand, of course, it, 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 I, even now, two years prior to them having to enlist into the military, it makes me very, very conscious about it and, very, and worried, concerned about them. Um, but it also, I think, created um, this, this understanding for, for me personally that on the other side, there's this deep-rooted hatred towards Israel and Jews. It is so deep-rooted. They were celebrating in the streets. I'm talking about not about the terrorists only, 
There are people in Gaza celebrating in the streets when bodies of young women half naked were dragged or in, in, in cars in, in, into Gaza. And they were celebrating. And I said, you know, it, it, it hit me in a, in a way that where is, you, you, even if you, you think we're enemies, but there has to be some kind of sense of humanity. And what we saw on that day was the worst of humanity, the worst of humanity. Um, I, I gave in the International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day that we gave. I gave a speech and I said, the Holocaust is a is a unique, unique event um, that cannot be compared to anything else. But what happened on October 7th, that day was a day of Holocaust on that day because it resembled what the Nazis do in the way that those who, the, the terrorists that infiltrated Israel just saw the humans in front of them as nothing. They can do with them as they want. They can murder them. They can decapitate them. They can rape them, burn them alive. Whatever they want to do, they can do. The difference is, and that's why I'm saying that the Holocaust is unique, is we have a, a, a state and we have a, an, an IDF, Israeli Defense Forces, that, can, that prevented October 7th into continuing to October 8th and 9th and 10th, just like Hamas wanted it to happen. That was not the case during the Holocaust. But that day of October 7th was for us a day of Holocaust. And, and it, it, I think it changed a lot of us um, as individuals. It changed us as a nation. Um, it made us understand much more how we really have to uh, make sure that uh, our security is our first priority. Um, but that will not weaken our um, willingness to try and find avenues of making, of reconciling, making peace, uh, living side by side in tranquility, in harmony, uh, benefiting each from each other with our neighbors. So, uh, so I do think it kind of sharpened that that sense of the need of security and of of concern for our children. I can see how it would have definitely developed resolve. I I can see that it would have reinforced yes. the need for the for for the directions that the nation has been heading in for the, the needs to develop socially a mindset that we have to move beyond survival and move into protection and progress. And progress has long been an uh, identifying factor of Israel as a people. Yeah. But I, I do want to regress for a little bit here. Mm -hmm. When I was growing up in San Fernando, in Trinidad and Tobago here, I have memories of, we have this library, this huge, well, relatively huge at the time library, the Carnegie Library, and it was this red building. And, you know, there were all these vendors that would be around. It was in the heart of the town. And, you know, there would be street food. I still remember when Nick and I were going to school, there, there would be this vendor. He would come up on a bicycle and sell doubles, one of our, um, a, a, a flatbread and chickpea. Uh, I, I I know doubles, yes. Right. I even tried it. I loved it. Yeah. And, and apologies to people who are going to come at me for describing it as flatbread and chickpeas. It's bara and chana. <laughs> but I still remember the taste. I remember the smells. I, I remember the colors of some of these buildings and the maxi taxis, um, public transport, well, privately owned mass transport that would have been in the heart of the town. And I wonder, what are the memories of Israel that you would have had as a child that unfortunately either no longer is it just because of the way things have developed or because yeah. of some of the incidents that have occurred? You know, what are your colors, your smells, your, your foods? Well, this is going to sound very strange to you. One of the vivid memories that we have as a child and because I've seen what happens around the world is first of all, the sense of freedom, despite what I told you about the, 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 um, the, the security. On the other hand, Israelis feel very free. So you'll see, you'll hear sirens, and two minutes later, you'll go and you'll see Israelis sitting in in coffee shops. So I think it's because maybe we, we just grew up with this and we're more resilient. But when I say freedom, as a child, you can go outside and there was no worries about pedophiles or even terrorists coming into your neighborhood because we knew there's an army that's protecting us. And you know, it was the Jewish people, so you didn't really have a lot of these kind of 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 criminal actions. So the sense of freedom was something that really, really was a very strong sense that we had as children. But the taste, by the way, and and you know, in Israel, we grew up on, on when you say street food, it's a falafel and hummus and, uh, and shawarma. Those are the tastes that I still 
I get wet in the mouth when I, when I speak about it. You know, I, those are the things that I grew up in that I love. And um, so falafel definitely, and, and shawarma definitely, that's part of the, 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 the culinary uh, history that we, we um, grow up with. And also you remember, I mean, in Israel, when you're invited uh, uh, to uh, have dinner or lunch, it's, oh, the table is always packed with food. It's different kinds. You start with different kinds of salads, and then you go to the main course with a different kinds of. It can be fish and 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 uh, chicken and meat, and and then of course the, the dessert. And I'll tell you, it's I, I, when I actually when I started in Croatia years ago, I brought this media delegation from Croatia to Israel. Just they, they just they they wanted to be, to record the fashion and the food and, and and different stuff about Israel. Actually, not political at all. And I took them to a restaurant. And so we started eating the restaurant and they brought all these salads, you know, um, from eggplant and cabbage, well, any uh, different kinds of these salads that you, with bread and hummus and tahini and they, and they ate it and ate. And then, you know, they said, wow, that was fitting. I said, what? Wait, that's only the beginning. And then they brought in the main meal, the main food. And they, what? They were, they were in shock about the amount of food. That's something that it's not just a taste. And by the way, the, the, the food in Israel is a, is a, is a mixture. Of of different kinds of foods, both are some of them have to do with Israel itself, but many is a mixture of food coming from the Orient and from the West, uh, from Arab speaking countries, from Africa, Latin America, and it's become a mixture. Uh, uh, the, the you know the cuisine in Israel is a mixture of different different tastes. Um, um, so I have a lot of fond memories when it comes to food. Uh, but both the amount and the taste. So yes, that's that's really a big part of the up, upbringing uh, in Israel. The food, absolutely. Um, one of the things we you we clearly have in common as a people is that mix, that that culinary mix. The yeah. in Trinidad and Tobago, we are almost legendary right, for the range of foods that we present and the richness of flavor. And I went to my well, food. It's, it's, it also stands for the diverseness and the richness of the people in Trinidad and Tobago. Absolutely. Agreed. I've seen them. And I had my first Hanukkah dinner uh, last year. And I was, it, growing up in Trinidad, I was still shocked at the, the presentation. At the, um, I've very rarely had a meal that made me feel so connected to the people I was eating with. And looking at the one, the cosmopolitan societies and the fact that we so richly embrace the external influence, that is clearly one thing that we have in common as a people. But in terms of uh, the Caribbean and Trinidad and Tobago as a people, and even where you're stationed in Panama, uh, what are the similarities besides food that you've seen between Israelis and us over here? You know, I, I've, I've seen quite a bit. I have to, I, I, and of course there are differences as well, but I've seen quite a bit. First of all, we're talking about two small countries. Yes, Trinidad and Tobago is way smaller than Israel. You're about the size of the territory is about a quarter of the size. And we're nine million people, while Trinidad and Tobago is around a million and a half. Um, so, but it's but still the sense of two small countries. And by the way, we see ourselves in a way as an island. We're not physically an island because because we have borders with Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. But we're an island in the way that if you want to really leave, leave Israel, you have to do it by plane or by boat. Um, it, it, we cannot go into our car actually and go, go and drive into Beirut or Damascus. And um, so we, in that, I think in that, that in that regard as well. But what I really, I, I, I think I struggled from the first moment were how open the Trinidad and Tobagans um, are. And I think that really felt to me a lot like Israelis. Sometimes Israeli openness can can um, be um, seen as even rude in a way. And they're not trying to be rude. They're, you know, Israelis can be very inquisitive, ask a lot of questions, but they'll also be happy to share a lot of the information about themselves. And when I was in Trinidad and Tobago, I met a, a, a people and they were asking me questions. And I really liked it. They were very open about it. Um, um, they were kind of polite. They were not being, but, but for me, it was, it was really great to see because we could have this open conversation and, and I did not have to really tread very carefully not to say something that might seem offending if I'm just asking a question. And, um, and that helped me a lot to really understand 
uh, what Trinidad uh, TNTs are um, about, and you know, and and how and what an, an open society it is. So I really enjoyed that, and I think that's a very strong similarity between our peoples: this openness and this willingness to interact and discuss and speak about uh, anything. Yeah. Well, Ambassador Barov, I'm I'm hoping that by the time we have another conversation or two, I get to call you Itai. Always, uh, of course. <laughs> because I, I, I firmly believe that as two unlikely candidates as we are, we are in a position to have conversations that would foster understanding so that we get a better idea of the similarities that we have as people and hopefully try to forge and foster relationships. Absolutely. All forward. I and know. Um, yes. Now, I just want to say, if, if you're, we are ending just before that, that, that um, I don't know how many... Um, Jewish friends you have today, but I, I truly hope that I'm on that list as well. And I, I really, it's always such a pleasure to speak with you, but I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. You could cut me off to say things like that anytime. <laughs> I have no problem with it. I, am, I do have a growing friendship. I do have a growing understanding. And I, I appreciate you for that because I will tell you, one of my challenges is that when I'm asked questions like, do you believe the things that you said in that interview? how did you end up in this space? That it was also necessary for me to get a better understanding of who you are as a person, because I understand that I can't assess who you are just based on the job that you perform. I personally needed to know who His Excellency Itai Bada was when he was not His Excellency. And I appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation like this. And I'm hoping that we can have more because we spoke on some of the similarities we didn't get to speak on the differences. And I also recognize as well that there would have been exchanges that we would have had as a region that did not sit favorably with you personally and professionally. And I'm, I'm hoping that we get an opportunity going forward to lean into some of the harder things to discuss, but also necessary. Sure, sure absolutely. I, I, I firmly believe that seeing the man as just one representative of the people versus the office as a representative of the state. I, I firmly believe it will help people become a little more open-minded to the position that Israel has and has to take. Absolutely. So I, I, appreciate I appreciate that very much. I, I want to say how much I appreciate, well, understanding Israel Foundation, first of all, but how much I appreciate you and Nicholas and everything you are doing and the openness in which you are doing it. You. I, I'm 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 just full of of gratitude towards you. And anytime you want me, um, I'm of course at your service. And uh, but on the condition that next time you call me Thai, um, I'm at your service. Anytime you need you you want to speak, absolutely. Great. I'm I'm definitely going to take you up on that, particularly because um, we still have about six questions that we could have gotten into. So I would love <laughs> I would love to have another better absolutely. understanding about Itai Bado, and. I thank you so much for the work that you've done. I would like to, again, I love to take liberties with com um, conversation. Uh, I will apologize after. But I want to extend to your wife and family, thank you. Because many people don't understand the level of sacrifice that it takes oh. from family to allow someone to live in purpose the way that you are. Yes. This 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 style of life, but especially as an Israeli ambassador, really affects the family a lot. And I can only join you in telling my wonderful, my beloved wife, Sarit, and to my amazing kids, I want to thank them for the support that they're giving me. Because, you know, they're they're living very far away from the place that they grew up and from their and from family. Um, but they're enjoying it, I have to say. But it is a sacrifice. And I'm I I I I. Join you in every word you said. I really want to want to thank my family as well for all their support and for what they're and for the sacrifice that they've been willing to give in, in uh, um, for me to realize my professional career. I appreciate you. And considering how much time you've already given us, I'm going to let you go because you've already yeah. agreed that my friend Itai would have another conversation with us as we develop always. a better understanding. Always, it's always. Good. Thank you so much, Ricardo. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. And as one of the three words you taught us, which is actually just one word, uh, shalom. Shalom. <laughs> yes. And next time, I hope we meet in in Trinidad and Tobago, and we and we have doubles together. We could make that happen. <laughs> Great. Looking forward. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. God bless. Bye bye.